I constantly would hear about people saying like, oh man, like why didn't they teach us about taxes in school? First of all, they probably they probably touched on it a bit and you weren't paying attention. You were looking at your phone. <laughs> exactly. But Gosh, right, students. Yeah. But now we'll have like the digital footprint of like, see, it was right there. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome back to Intuit for Education's Teaching Finance series with me, May. So I have two baby girls, and recently we've been introducing the concepts of savings and spending with our five-year-old. For example, if she's extra sweet to her baby sister or decides to proactively read a book, we will reward her. Well, this week she finally saved enough to buy something. Now I was really rooting for her to get something useful like a cool book, but guess what she chose? Yes, this is a unicorn's tail. She's really proud of herself though, so just goes to show how financial literacy really is for everyone. Anyway, today we are going to tackle the topic of developing financial literacy through experiential and interdisciplinary learning. And you know what? We have the perfect guest to do so. Dr. Andrea Forkham, who's also known as the famous educator Andrea on TikTok and Instagram, spent most of the past decade in the K-12 classroom, basically teaching English to every grade in high school. This fall, she transitioned to teaching pre-service teachers at Indiana State University. And get this, Andrea has a master's degree in secondary education and in English and a PhD in curriculum and instruction. And there's more. She's also a keynote speaker and an entrepreneur who's constantly finding new ways to support teachers with humor. Oh yes, she is really funny and realistic resources that help make their lives better. All right, Andrea, I'll stop embarrassing you, but please tell us more about yourself. Yeah. So in addition to all of like the school stuff, I am a mom of two kids. My kids are three and five. And I have been working at Indiana State just for this one semester. The impact of my time, you know, in the K through 12 classroom is my whole inspiration far more than any of like the college stuff, any of the classroom learning I did. It was because I had all of that experiential learning that I feel like I'm a really good professor for pre-service teachers. Um, and then the TikToks and Instagram stuff, that's just kind of where I go to find inspiration and to share hopefully some humor and support for the community that I found online. I was telling Andrea off uh, the podcast earlier that me and my team have heavily stalked her on social media and we laugh so hard. It's, it's so funny. So everyone should go check you out. Thank you. Do you think you can talk a little bit just in your thoughts in general on why financial literacy, that that knowledge is really important and impactful to impart onto high school students? Absolutely. So Mashi, when I was in high school, I have this vivid memory um, because my parents never gave us credit cards because they wanted to protect us from getting into mm. debt. And so they gave us debit cards instead. And the bank that I was at, they wouldn't stop you from spending more money than you had in your account. They would just charge mm. you if you overdrew. And of course, like mm. a lot of banks, it, it was like not two dollars every time you overdrew it was like however much you took out plus thirty dollars plus thirty dollars so every time if i went right. to like the movies and then got popcorn and candy and then all of that and so i oh, was living my best life you know i had a job <laughs> making minimum wage and all right. of that um and i thought i still had money in my account and i was just do 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 to do and then all in, they sent <laughs> they sent a letter to my house for every single time that i swiped it so I got in one day like seven letters with the red, you know, when you know, when you see like the red. Oh, yeah. And you're like, oh, no. <laughs> and I didn't know at that point. I just knew that when I got home, my parents had them stacked on the kitchen table and were like, you need to have oh, a seat. Oh, no. My dad is famous for being like, he's very, very wise. Like he grew up um, under the poverty line, but has made wonderful, uh, you know, financial decisions for our family. He, you know, yeah. showed us all of the, uh, showed me all of these and was like, Andrew, if you do not get this spending under control, it will ruin your life. Wow. <laughs> like, and I was like 16 yeah. at the time. And I'm like, oh. I don't want to ruin my life. Right. But like, <laughs> he, he really wanted to get it right. through my head that like, I didn't like, I did not want to have to be stressed about this all the time. I did not want to have to not right. know. And 
So then I had to do like the walk of shame into the bank and like beg them to take away some of the fees. And because it was like, did it work? It did Did work. Thank God, because I was sobbing, of course. I'm some 16 year old sobbing, and they have the ability to take away some of the fees. But then from then on, it was such a good learning thing for me. Mm -hmm. And as a high schooler, I wish I had had the opportunity to do a course or a module. Learning financial literacy at a young age is super, super important and talking about those things. And it's, you know, it's, it's amazing to me how many people don't talk about some of the core things we need to be successful in life. Like I know people right. who never had a conversation with their parents about money ever. Right. So like, many. My, yeah, exactly. My dad was at like rich dad, poor dad, kind of a dad. Like he grew up, you know, without any money. He went to yeah. TA school, became a physician's assistant and awesome. talked to us about money, talk to us about you know, the cost mm-hmm. of college, the cost of planning, the cost and all of those things. And even with that, I still, you know, struggled early on. Um, mm-hmm. But those are the kinds of things that when I was a teacher, I saw those conversations just didn't happen, you know, unless yeah. I, as the teacher, was able to somehow provide resources and give them, right. you know, something so that they could practice with this idea of financial literacy. Yeah. I mean, that, that makes so much sense. And I know you've been teaching high school for like 10 years and such. Any examples or things that you've done teaching English to all different grades? How have you maybe incorporated that into your lesson plans if you're teaching about a certain book or things like that? So there's a couple of different project-based things that we did. Um, none that were as good as Intuit for Education because I math <laughs> makes me cry. Like, <laughs> just like I, I really did try and partner with the math teachers and talk to, you know, do mm. some, some cross-curricular collaboration and be like, hey, like, yeah. let's get this together. Let's get a project together. So some of the things yeah. we would do is um, they would be in their math class and they would have to create a, a whole like financial plan. So what job do you want? Cool. What, yeah. How much do they make? Cool. How much is that net? Great. Okay. Now you got to add on childcare. Are you going to have kids? Because if you're going to have kids, there's going to be childcare. So they would have to plan all of that. And then in my class, we would work on creating a resume, creating a cover letter, figuring oh. out the the soft skills that go along with the financial literacy piece. And so we would collaborate on that so that we could give these kids a better idea because, you know, they're totally fine totally. with working at, you know, McDonald's or Walmart or something like that, making minimum wage. Until yeah. they realize how how hard it's going to be for them, because you know when you're 16 and you're working there, you're like, look at all this expendable income I have. Yeah. Um, but then yeah, it's so true. If they're doing you know anything outside of like living with their parents, they're, it's going to be hard. Uh, yeah. And if we can teach them those things before they're you know three years out of high school or three years into debt through college. Like they need to, they need to know why they should be filling out stuff for grants and filling out opportunities for scholarships and all of that because yeah. it's it it can change their lives. Totally, yeah, that that makes so much sense. And I want to touch upon that interdisciplinary project thing that you're talking about, this interdisciplinary learning, because I think a lot of teachers want to do that, but they don't really know how to implement it. Yeah. So one of the coolest things with problem based learning is that it gives real world scenarios for your students. So if you have a group of kids, they're all going to have different interests. They're all going to have different passions. And when you go in the real world, it's not like part of your day, you have to do math and part of your day, you do English. Like everything is kind of intermingled. So you want to try and emulate that in the classroom as much as possible. So, you know, if you can have buy-in across the curriculum, you could say, okay, guys, we need to identify a problem. And you could give them a list of problems right. too to start with and be like, hey, um, and it could be local to your community. So it's connected to that. Or it can be, you know, larger, like, hey, maybe they want to create something where um, an AI software type thing. So something that they're already going to be interested in and something that solves a problem in their community. And then yeah. once they've figured out, that specific problem, then you have them do research. So that's an ELA piece, but part of the research is also going to be math-based and financial-based because a lot of these things require funding or would require funding if it went out of the planning stages. And one of the really cool, cool things I loved for Intuit 
for education was that there was a whole module for entrepreneurship. Right. I have had to do all of my entrepreneurial stuff completely without training. Like literally just me and Google wow. saying, will I go to jail if I don't charge sales tax on these drop shipping shirts? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, and wow. like having right. no experience, no idea of how to do anything. And all of a sudden I start selling shirts online and I'm like, is, am I going to, who's check? How do I, who do I give taxes yeah. to? Who am I even sending this? Like all of these little things that you don't even know you need until you're there and having a resource like Intuit for Education, like for me as an ELA teacher, like I am not the person to teach math without the proper tools. <laughs> Right, right. I, it's, I feel that way about English. I'm like, I need to really prepare and have all the resources. Exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so if I'm going to have my students do project-based learning and do cross-curricular stuff, I'm going to need a yeah. resource like Intuit for Education in order to be able to help my students be successful. Because that's not, yeah. you know, I studied English in early college and now I've, I've studied, you know, right. education. So like that is not yeah. my core thing. So if I can give them tools and there's so many like differentiating things. So if there's one group that's like, oh, I don't need to really know the entrepreneurship thing. I really just need to focus on right. budgeting um, or something like that. There's options for that too. So it, it allows differentiation right. without putting the mental load on the individual teacher, which is a dream, honestly. Yeah. That's honestly what we here are sought after to do. You know, we really want to make it light for a teacher so that they have all the resources that they need so that they can teach their students, like exactly how you described, much easier, Yeah, you know, with a light lift. Yeah. And I'm wondering for those who are listening right now, the educators, um, what advice can you give them just in general about both experiential learning and interdisciplinary learning? How can they um, incorporate that into their own classrooms. And I wonder, cause I know you touched upon this a lot about them, fo you focusing on your students' goals first and setting that, um, with, like, what would you recommend, I guess, a place to start for educators who might have not explored this and want to try that in their classrooms? One of the core things that I found was the ability of a teacher to communicate and rely on their peers at their school was huge. It was a massive factor for whether or not they felt overwhelmed or stressed. So true. When you're going out and trying to do experiential or project-based learning for the first time, talk to your colleagues and find out if they have a model for it. Find out if they're doing something already that you can join in on because it doesn't. Ha you don't have to live in a vacuum where you are just doing this yeah. whole massive project yourself. Because um, I think that for a lot of teachers, they're like, well, here are the standards I have to hit. I don't have time to add anything else in. Well, like maybe, but maybe you can just join in on something that somebody else is doing. Um, I made sure yeah. at one of my schools that when I was teaching the Great Gatsby, they were teaching the Roaring Twenties in the social studies class. Oh, wow. And that's so cool. See, yeah, that's such good advice, it, right? So, you know, just try mm -hmm. and and it's hard. I don't want to be unempathetic to the fact that it's hard because yeah. everyone's busy. It is. And you, you know, right. earlier the better for trying to line those things up. Like I was really good friends with yeah. the social studies team. So I was able to talk before the mm -hmm. school year started and be like, okay, what month are we doing this? Great. And, oh. and put it on the calendar early. Um, so a lot of planning and look out for the resources that are available to you. Um, cause there are yeah. a lot of really great resources out there. Switching topics a little bit from K-12 to higher ed. I just wanted to just get your thoughts. Cause I know you're just starting that field now. Um, in general, like how do you see into it for education or just financial literacy in general, um, be useful for college students as well. So I know you touched upon high school and why it's so important, like you as a 16 year old to know this financial literacy concepts and savings and budgeting and spending. Um, what about with college kids? How do you see that be as applicable? Um, and yeah, share your thoughts on just your experience teaching that higher ed right now. Yeah, it's been fascinating because, you know, as a college student myself, I, I worked full time while going to school full time. So I had left debt yeah. and all of that. And I think it's really important, especially for me as a, a teacher of future teachers, to to have resources like this where I can make it right. part of the discussion because it would be nice to think that by the time they're in college, they have all of these tools available to them. You know, they've already learned these yeah. things. But the reality is, is a lot of my students were, you know, finishing or gosh, three years ago, they just started college at the end of COVID. A lot of my students like yeah. missed their graduation. 
missed their senior oh, year, I know. like could have possibly missed out on financial literacy courses that they should have taken in high school, yeah. you know, all of these different things. So for me as a college instructor to give them these resources and because I teach teachers, I spend a lot of my time yeah. saying, here are these free resources that you can use in your classroom. They're fantastic. Use them. Um, so that's super key. Um, and another thing that I found is just the availability, like for like I'm learning things looking at Intuit for Education. Like uh, yeah. at you all- said entrepreneur. Yes. Yeah. 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 Like, like your business. Exactly. <laughs> and I was like telling my husband about it. I was like, dude, I wish I had this <laughs> like two years ago Aww. when I started this whole thing. Because same and Googling, mm-hmm. YouTubing and looking online from completely unvetted sources, right? Like they say, yeah, like, how do you know what to trust out there? Exactly. Seriously, how and, do you know? I don't, yeah. And everyone's on their hustle and everyone's on their grind, right? You, you log on and they're like, cool, cool, cool. I'll tell you how to, you know, set up your business. And then they're like, but if you want the fifth step that, you know, is the one that you'll go to jail if you don't follow, you sign up for my course and that'll be $300 a month and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, it's just- <laughs> So, so stressful. And so, you know, to have access to these resources, you know, as a professional, as an entrepreneur, and as somebody who is, you know, preparing future teachers, it's really exciting to think that these resources are available for them. How can educators use our curriculum, Intro for Education in particular, how is that useful for them in the classroom? Yeah. So one of the things I really loved is how short the videos are. Like they're, they're Mm. like little bite-sized pieces and they're cut into modules. And, but they're, they're really engaging and that's yeah. hard to do. Like, I think we've all been in HR trainings before that are like <laughs> 15 minutes of some person droning on about something and it's really dry and that's not it at all. Yeah. Like you've got like pretty young, kind of like vibrant people doing these videos. Yeah. They're like short digestible pieces. And then there's little checks, like they ask questions and they have you respond. Yeah. So it's, it's not just you sitting there absorbing. It's like, you watch a video, cool, and then you you reflect on something that they they talked about, and you apply it and have that experiential learning piece where you're like, okay, cool. How does this actually affect the way I'm going to live my life? Um, which is yeah. it's it's key to pedagogy, you know. Like that's huge that you have those moments of like, wait, let me think about it for a second. Um, so for yeah. for teachers trying to figure out how to integrate this into their classroom, I mean, it's it's such an easy way of providing your students something that they're going to use in the real world. But that's the question we always get is like, how will we ever use this? And it's like, okay, well, literally I could not make this more applicable. (laughs) And like, there's a whole section on taxes. And like, I constantly would hear about people saying like, oh man, like, why didn't they teach us about taxes in school? First of all, they probably, they probably touched on it a bit and you weren't paying attention. You were looking at your phone. (laughs) Exactly. Gosh, students. Yeah. Now we'll have like the digital footprint of like, see, it was right there. Remember how you you got to do these modules. Um, (laughs) But anything that you, you can provide to your students that can be differentiated like that, that can be self-paced where you can allow them to explore a little bit too and find yeah. the niche that fits for what they're passionate about. Because I have had some students yeah. that are very entrepreneurial. They, they have like a whole plan of what they want to do and like high schoolers, right? Like I'm going to make That's this amazing. and this. Yeah. And so I, I want to like allow them to go forward and, and do that stuff. And then the kids that are like, how are we ever going to use this? I don't want to be here. It's like, cool, cool, cool. Taxes, you will have to do <laughs> like hundred percent. And, right, and tra- right. taxes are like a super dry thing. But even on taxes, I feel like Intuit for Education did a really good job of making it engaging and having enough stop mm-hmm. points where you can like engage with the material. So there's there's so many yeah. ways you can do it, even as an English teacher, you know, like you can find ways like I always did like resumes and cover letters. That's obviously like the yeah. low hanging fruit for an English teacher. Um, but there's a lot of different things that you can do. You could have them create some sort of budget for a project that maybe they're interested in or be a part of something happening at the school and be like, okay, we're going to fill out like applications for grants. But in order to fill out this application for a grant, we have to budget for how much this thing is going to cost. And so like, there's a lot of different ways that we can tie these things in. Okay. My last question for you, Andrea, is just in general, what would you want to share and impart on the educators who are listening right now? Um, if they're teaching in high school and they're struggling, what would you, what's one thing maybe that a mentor has taught you or that you have developed over the 10 years in the classroom, what would you want to share with folks 
like the biggest piece of advice that you have? So the first thing I think is that teachers should know that they're not alone and that people do care about what they're going through, about what they're doing, about the effort they're putting in. And that Mm -hmm. I just want to encourage them that teaching is the bravest and most rebellious act of hope that we can have in this world. And we are incredibly fortunate that we still have people signing up to do this profession because it's been a rough couple of years. And it's a beautiful thing that we still have teachers that are willing to go to bat for these students. Thank you so much, Andrea. I, I so enjoyed our conversation. You're so cool to talk to. Um, can you shout out for everyone, like your social stuff? Like where can people find you if they just want to learn more from you? Yeah. So if you go to educatorandrea.com, you can find my website that has like my merch and stuff like that. And then I have digital resources on teacherworkroom.com. And then on Instagram and TikTok, I'm Educator Andrea. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Appreciate you. you. Thanks. <laughs> wow. What a cool opportunity we just had to learn from Andrea. As always, if you enjoy this episode, share it with everyone. And of course, subscribe to hear more from inspiring educators and myself. See you next time. Mm-hmm.